Okay. Welcome to the real, the real Thomas Jefferson, episode 19. Um, today's episode, we will discuss Thomas Jefferson's about hatred of Patrick Henry, or did he not? Um, Dr. Holacek will dissect this situation. Um, Patrick Henry is known to all Americans, if only for his fiery assertion and a public declamation, give me liberty or give me death. He is also thought by American scholars to be one of the most singular spokesmen for America's break with Great Britain. Almost all American historians believe that Thomas Jefferson hated Patrick Henry. Henry was, after all, very likely behind the push to place Jefferson on trial for dereliction of duty, perhaps even for cowardice after his two-year stint as governor ended in 1781. Moreover, scrutiny of Jefferson's writings paints a less than favorable picture of Henry. Consequently, there are good reasons to think that Jefferson hated Patrick Henry. In this episode, number 19, we ask, did Jefferson really hate Patrick Henry? Really? How do you uh, well, like my, my white poppies out here in the dry Texas sky? Are they not beautiful? One of my favorite just, flowers. I love the way you travel to all these different cities to record the show. It's all that money I make, all that, the big money, the revenue I make from oh, all these shows on, on I YouTube, know. you know, millions and of you, dollars keep pumping in. And you pay me nothing. That's it. You got all those books in the back, though. I'm going to sell my books in the background to make money. Yep, they're all old. <laughs> but uh, oh, oh, I'll zip it now. If, they're if you all pull out, the whole uh, bookcase might crumble and fall down. Yeah, you never know. Um, all right, what is this show about? This okay, is this show, the aim of this show, the real Thomas Jefferson, um, since publication of Merrill D. Peterson's groundbreaking, groundbreaking manuscript, The Jefferson Image in the American Mind, nearly all Jeffersonian biographers take it upon themselves to write on Jefferson's protean nature or Janus facedness. What Jefferson says most often cannot be understood literally. His prose must then be deconstructed, and so intuitiveness and knack are needed in preference to logical acumen. One scholar who spent a career writing on Jefferson said that Jefferson simply cannot be known. Hmm. It is commonplace to wonder call who that is, huh? Could, could that be someone, uh, P.O.? <laughs> and that doesn't stand for pissed off. That stands for Peter Olaf. <laughs> um, it is commonplace to call the man a contradiction. Well, who isn't? I mean, we, I, we, oh, anyway, I won't. None of us are. Person we can't have, be a contradiction. I have, we have to have a show that I can just release all of my uh, frustration with how critical everyone is when we all have different sides of us, different uh, opinions that may contradict. We all do that. That is just no, human nature. We, we seldom ha ha entertain contradictory, as we talked before. We don't entertain contradictions. Contradictions are necessarily falsehood. And, you know, we, we, we don't entertain contradictory views as true because they can't be true. That would be to entertain a logical falsehood, right? And that's, we just don't do that. We don't we don't walk around thinking, ah, it's sunny outside in Flint. And at the same time that it's sunny, it's not sunny. Right. Oh, I'm talking about as, as people, sometimes we may feel a specific way about something, but there are always, this isn't a black and white world. There are very many shades. No, I mean, fine. Sometimes we're in, the, we're in the gray or sometimes we don't right. know, but we don't go around asserting contradictions. My, my point right. is I always grouse about people using the word contradiction without knowing what it means definitionally. So yeah. anyways. Okay. So it is commonplace to call the man a contradiction as if a person can have the property of a necessarily false sentence. This show aims to dispel that myth. Jefferson can be known and logic, not intuitive deconstruction is the method. I, love I, I am Donna Vitek, and this is The Real Thomas Jefferson, episode 19. Okay, and so those first are some I'd like real to... white poppies in the background somewhere in the world. I do have some students because uh, they were asking questions. What is the name of the show? So um, so I, I do want to start at, with the basics. 
um, in American history. Who was Patrick Henry? I'm going to say a lot about him. We All of us know something about him. He was a rough contemporary of Jefferson, born in 1736, so he was seven years older than Jefferson. He was the first governor of Virginia, would become governor later. He was governor prior to Jefferson being governor of Virginia. Uh, he was a man of high accomplishments. He was a lawyer. He had very fine oratorical skills. He was fiery, persuasive in speech. And that's what he was known for. As you mentioned, he presumably uttered, give me liberty or give me death. Right? Right. Uh, William Wirt writes that down in his biography. We'll get to that. Now, he made his name first in a, the Parsons cause. This is a time where the Anglican uh, clergy all over Virginia were to be paid for their services in tobacco. Uh, they were to be given 16,000 pounds of tobacco a year, which amounted to two pennies a pound, right? And in 1758, there was a very bad crop of tobacco. So the price of tobacco jumped up, which means um, the clergy were to be given three times their normal salary because of the uh, scarcity of tobacco. And this, of course, went to court and, you know, Virginia's House of Burgesses, they responded with the Two Penny Act, which mandated that the clergy would be making two pennies and no more than two pennies. Not going to be making six pennies a pound because of a bad crop. That would make the salary fluctuant and attending, attendant upon, um, you know, the quality of the crop. They mm -hmm. wanted a more stable measure of both paying the Anglican. So Reverend James Morey, right, who was Thomas Jefferson's teacher. He was a very classical, good classical scholar, says Jefferson. Uh, sues Hanover County on April 1, 1762 for back wages. You know, he's not been getting his money because of, uh, for, for being a, a, an Anglican minister. So in effect, he represents the plight of all Anglican ministers. And um, what happens is the court rules in favor of Maury. Maury wins the case. He's to get his back paid. Uh, so the question now is, how much money is he going to get for back pay? Um, what happens is the king intervenes in the matter. And he gives his opinion, and that's, in some sense, how the decision gets uh, placed in favor of Maury. Uh, a young Patrick Henry at the time you know, hears of this, and he's incensed. Uh -huh. um, he says that the king, by his veto and intervention in colonial matters, and I quote here, degenerated into a tyrant and forfeits all rights to his subject's obedience. So here we have the first instance of Patrick Henry uh, speaking on behalf of the rights of Virginian colonists, uh -huh. and that the king, who is, you know, the, the king of the subjects here, but he's intervening in affairs without giving them um, any sort of representation. So he's, you know, incensed by that. Then we have the Stamp Act. Jefferson is 22 and Henry is, what, seven years, 29 at the time. And young Jefferson in 1765, that would mean Jefferson is 22, right? Uh, he's at the House of Burgess's door and he's listening in to Henry speak and he writes, uh, he says, Henry's oratorical skills were great indeed, such as I have never heard from any other man. He appeared to me as wow. to speak as Homer wrote. Now, this is extraordinarily oh. high praise. Homer's the blind poet, uh, right. uh, uh, the Greek poet uh, in the 8th century B.C., and Jefferson loved reading Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and other short stories and stuff. And uh, to, to, so to say that he appeared to me to speak as Homer wrote, now notice he uses appeared to me, right? And I think Jefferson puts the qualifying or waters it down, says appeared to me because I was young at the time and highly impressionable. Okay. Um, um, now, Henry 
vociferously reacted to the Stamp Act, which was a uh, uh, an act that put tariffs on any sort of uh, paper, printed material like newspapers, uh, legal papers, magazines, playing cards were to be made from paper that was manufactured and stamped in London. The colon colonials, colonialists were not to be making their own paper. So again, uh, Britain taking control over matters that could be handled quite easily and succinctly in the colonies. Uh, so and cheaper. And, and, you know, Americans are slowly but surely, these are not terrible taxes, but the idea is just when someone's controlling your affairs, you get a little pissed off. Pissed off you, know? Mm -hmm. you know, so Henry, um, right, he puts forth several stamp act resolves to the House and first four pass. And he maintains and just that the colonies and I write, read, read from him. All the liberties, privileges, franchises, and immunities that have at any time been held, enjoyed, and possessed by the people of Great Britain. And he says the only legitimate taxation is of the people by themselves or by persons chosen by themselves to represent them. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a tax, right, it must be sanctioned either directly by the people mm -hmm. or directly, indirectly by representatives of the people. Mm -hmm. right? are in contact with the people. And as this tax is not going by either route, Henry uh, rather vociferously objects to what's been going on here. Now, well, the last thing I'll say is the, the great line, give me liberty, give me death, occurs in 1775. Jefferson is in his early 30s, uh, 43, he's 32 at the time. And um, this is in St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. And Henry enjoins his fellow Virginians potentially to take up arms against Great Britain. This is a, a, an enormous suggestion or injunction here, mm -hmm. him bidding the, uh, the other biddable Virginians to perhaps even take up arms because of these taxes. And as we said before, the taxes are not overwhelmingly difficult. But it's the idea of adding more taxes and not letting them have a voice, mm -hmm. either through them direct voice or a voice through representatives in terms of the taxation, mm -hmm. right? So you know we're we're fighting for liberty. And, and Henry says, "I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death." Does now did did work? Did uh, excuse me? Did Henry actually say that? No, probably not. We'll get into that in a little bit. But so much for, you know, so he's a uh, he's a libertarian in the sense of, not in the sense we talk of today, but someone fighting for liberty. Right. The liberal, if you want to call it, you know, early liberal and colonial liberal fighting for not liberty. Not the liberal as we know it today. No, and he's a lawyer, and he's passionate, and he's eloquent enough at least to get people to listen to him. Right, I should say in the one uh, case, um, the two penny, we talked of uh, the Maury Affair, two penny act, uh, Henry spoke so eloquently against the king intervening that the jury who had to decide on what sort of recompense Maury and the other Anglican churchmen were supposed to get awarded one penny to, to Maury for the back wages, right? He's getting which was in effect telling the king to, to buzz off, uh -huh. right? Having such a negligible uh, fine being paid. I still like my white poppies. I do too. Are you ready for question number two? I guess so. Okay, so why do scholars assert that Jefferson hated Henry? What evidence do they have? Verifiable evidence. Well, you read certain things that Jefferson writes, it's suggestive of animosity. To Patrick Henry. Well, wait, wait, wait. Is it is it animosity or disagreement? Well, it's I'm saying it's suggestive of animosity. Okay. I didn't say it was is hate based. Okay. And I'll, I'll give you just a couple, um, couple instances. Um, he talks of in his autobiography. He talks of uh, and I read Henry's sublime imagination, his lofty and overwhelming diction. Right. 
And, you know, so it's hard to say whether he's being speaking favorably or, or unfavorably of him. And it also calls him the laziest man in reading I ever knew. And he gives the example of, I think it was uh, a couple of volumes by political essays of David Hume that Henry asked to borrow from Jefferson's library. And Jefferson gives him the volumes. And weeks later, the volumes are returned. And, and um, Jefferson asked Henry what he thought of them. And he says, well, I really couldn't get through the stuff. And Jefferson, you know, customarily speaks of Henry's lack of education. Like Jefferson, he knew the violin, but he's more of a fiddler than a classical violinist. He uh, was a relatively crude and uncultured person, unlike Jefferson. So they were like um, the odd couple, right? Yeah. Who are the two guys on the odd couple? Felix and... Uh, yeah, completely opposite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just Henry's... Uh, Jefferson is sort of like Felix and... Uh, and uh, Henry's more of the uncultured slob, you know, like the other fellow on the odd couple. Brilliant, brilliant movie, by the way. Um, so Henry did it like, and it, it appears he says something to the effect that Henry studied for the bar for something like six weeks and he passed it. And if you read, we've talked of before, Jefferson's recommendations for lawyers, um, and you, you read Jefferson talking to a certain Moore, Bernard Moore, recommending readings. And Jefferson gives this list of stuff to read over the years. And you're going to be studying just about everything. Right. And studying from morning till night. You know, the day is like 14 hours of study. Mm -hmm. No one can study. Jefferson right. wanted a lawyer to be uh, a polymathic, to, to know everything about everything mm -hmm. that was of any relevance to that might come up in the case of law. Mm -hmm. You might, weather might come up. So you had to know something about weather, geology might come up, you have to deal. You know. So he had people studying everything. And Henry got by because he could speak persuasively. Oh. Okay. And and that's and, and here's another passage. Jefferson writes to Leviatt Harris in 1824, late in 1824. I never heard anything that deserved to be called by the same name with what flowed from him and where he got that torrent of language is unconceivable. He says, I have frequently shut my eyes while he spoke and when he was done, asked myself what he had said without being able to recollect a word of it. He was no logician, right? So there's evidence that he's hates him. Henry speaks, and it's almost like he doesn't even know what he's saying, and people sort of jump, and they obey, they listen, whatever he's saying to do. Give uh -huh. me liberty or give me death, and everybody, you know, raises up in arms, yes, I'm ready to fight to lose my life if I have to for liberty without really thinking about what he said. Right. But notice what he says in the last <laughs> sentences of the same letter to uh, Leviat Harris. He was no logician, but then he adds, he was truly a great man, however, one of enlarged views. Now, what does he mean by enlarged views? Um, I don't think he at all means that Henry had a lot of knowledge. What Jefferson thinks is Henry was a man who could speak persuasively, though he didn't speak logically, clearly, or plainly, when he could get people to do what he wanted them to do because he had a large, booming voice and he had a masterly presence in front of other people. Okay. Okay, so so it's, I guess, misinterpreted, would you say? Uh, what, his writings? Um, Jefferson has been mis misinterpreted, maybe? Yes, I think so. I think they, you know, we talked of, you mentioned in your introduction that when Jefferson was governor of Virginia, uh, there's a lot of questions about Jefferson's incapacity as uh, governor from 1779, 1781. And uh, there was a move after he resigned, after his second year of being governor, uh, Jefferson himself was overwhelmed by the job and he had a very strict constructionist approach to the Virginia constitution, which got him into trouble. He realized later when he became president, you can't always obey the letter of the law in dire circumstances when 
when the country, the state itself, could be overrun and uh, raised by the British Army. Right. If there's no state, why do you care about the Constitution when the state's gone? Right. Well, sometimes you might have to. But he, he, he was a very strict constructionist, and he, he came to learn from that. But Henry uh, was seen to be behind prosecuting Jefferson for not only incompetence, but also cowardice. Henry certainly was not like Jefferson. He was not, not afraid to take charge of matters uh, physically. Yeah. So there were men who, by constitution, were very radically different. Different, right. So maybe it's the differences we're seeing that, uh, yeah, this, this makes sense. It's starting to make sense. Question number three. Um, uh, well, okay, Thomas Jefferson was once a lawyer. Might he not merely have been jealous of Patrick Hen Henry's oratorical skills, um, his ability to move men with his mannerisms and words? Yes. Oh, yeah. How was that for an answer? <laughs> okay. I think he was. I, no, I do. I, okay. I, I think... number four. <laughs> we can, but I, no, I, I'm giving you a very succinct, as I like to say, brachologous answer. Um, oh. I don't know if that's easy. That sounds like a bad cold. Yeah. Um, he Jefferson was a very poor public speaker. That's well known. He had a soft oh. voice. He uh, he might have had, it might be fair to say without being sexist here, that he, he was more effeminate than masculine in his appearance. That's not, there, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Effeminate is a word. Well, today, if you say something like that, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're pointing to two genders. There are 15 genders. You know that, right? <laughs> I yeah. was reading at a college I used to teach, at which I used to teach, and they were talking about going through all the genders and pronouns and everything and explaining. And I'm thinking, my goodness. How ridiculous this has all become, right? Yeah. Anyways, but I mean, I think he was very effeminate in some sense. I, I would assume he didn't have the hyper masculinity that probably Patrick Henry possessed. A loud, booming voice, you know, gesticulating and maybe a thicker, a burlier yeah. person than was Jefferson. I don't know about Jeff, uh, Henry's uh, physical attributes. But uh, Jefferson probably was jealous. It's, it's, it's impossible not to be. Here a guy in, in many respects, not highly intelligent, not widely read, and yet men listen to him and do what he says to do. Right. right. Jefferson he commands, was a lawyer. Yeah. Jefferson, when, when Jefferson was a court lawyer, he was, uh, he was uh, frustrated with his ability to to. You know, he he won a number of cases, of course, and he was quite good because he was very logical and highly prepared. But logic in preparation don't always win the day in law. Right. right. Sometimes bullshit wins the day. You know, <laughs> if you're a good lawyer, you, it you, does. You, can, you know, you can <laughs> buffalo people, use yeah. some trickery. And Jefferson was too honest to want to have to do that. And I think he got frustrated with law and left it. But Henry was a perfect, I hate to say this, but he was a perfect lawyer, right? He had the presence, he could convince people, convince juries, and, and you know, you wanted to believe that what he said was true, but it was otherwise with Jefferson. So he could have been very easily, I think Jefferson was probably a little bit um, jealous. Mm. Mm. With my okay. beard manager here. Yes, prepare for the next okay, part. well, this is the last thing I'm going to ask for today. William Work, a friend of Thomas Jefferson's, wrote a book on Henry. What did Thomas Jefferson think of the biography? Yes. Uh, remember, Henry died in, what, 1799? And he was born seven years prior to Jefferson. Jefferson was born 1743. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Work was born in 1772. He writes his biography titled Sketches of the Life and Character of Patrick Henry in 1817. Mm -hmm. So, this is 18 years after the death of Henry. As he's preparing this volume, he is asking those who knew Patrick Henry, people like Jefferson, for information about Henry, because, you know, Wirt was much too young, right, to learn anything 
about Henry. I mean, it, you know, and he had to gather information through other sources for people who knew Henry, roughly Henry's age or maybe a little bit younger. And he contacts, if you read the correspondence between Jefferson and William Ward, you know, Jefferson is giving him an abundance of information about particulars of, this is where you're gonna get a lot of what Jefferson says that seems to suggest that Jefferson hated Henry. Oh, okay. Right? Uh, on, he writes <laughs> the words, August 4, 1805, in matters of law, Henry's opinion was not worth a copper. He was avaricious and rotten hearted. His two great passions were love of money and fame. But when these came into competition, the former love of money predominated. You can see how you might think this is, he hates Henry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this one I had my uh, aha moment when I was reading all the various references by Jefferson to Henry. It seems to me one could take this as hate-based or one could just take it as factual, mm -hmm. right? His opinions, you know, if a guy is really driven by love of money, that's mm -hmm. going to really move him more than anything else right. instead of justice. You're not worried about justice. You're worried about right. money. Right. And Jefferson could only have, you know, disliked that. Now, it seems to me that he's probably quite right that Henry was avaricious and rotten. Uh, he writes seven years later, uh, 1812, to work. Mr. Henry's ravenous avarice, his greed, was the only passion paramount to his love of popularity. In ordinary business, and he's talking about the House of Burgesses here, he was a very inefficient member. He could not draw a bill on the most simple subject, which would bear legal criticism or even the ordinary criticism, which looked to correctness of style and ideas. For indeed, there was no accuracy of idea in his head. His imagination was copious, poetical, sublime. Now he's giving him his due right here. But he had a great imagination. It was, it was wide. And it was even sub sublime, meaning it, it really, like a Gothic church you walk in, you're in awe of it. But uh -huh. vague also. He said the strongest things in the finest language, but without logic, without arrangement, desultorily, right? Arbitrarily. So again, you could say he's being pejorative and hateful, but I don't think so. I think he's just being correct about him. Here's a person who's not well read, who's not highly intelligent, but he has a gift for speaking. He has a great imagination. He can move men. And Jefferson's uh just sharing it. You know, this isn't the first time that Jefferson's words were, I, I, I don't know if I want to say taken out of context, but um, he does speak. He will just give you the facts. He's not saying it with malice intent, um, just as he described the Native Americans and the African Americans back, you know, way back when yes. he wasn't saying it to be cruel or to hurt anyone. He was just giving laying out what he saw as the facts. He's trying to be accurate. Right. So that's so anybody who knows Jefferson knows that's how he thinks and that's how he speaks. He's not doing it or saying anything to be cruel. Yeah. Uh, that's that's why I had my aha moment, that, that Jefferson really is a stoic. He's really trying to, when he's describing someone like Washington, or other people, Alexander Hamilton, presumably that he hates, right? Whom he hates. He's just describing them as accurately as he can. He's, he, he's and he didn't hate them because the, you know they were working deals together when when they when Jefferson was president for getting votes in the in the um in Congress for certain yeah. things. They were helping each other, scratching each other's back. He didn't to hate to some them. extent, and to another extent, but Jefferson did question the motives of people like that. Right. And he did not respect avarice and things like that. Um, let me see if I have anything else I can read. Um, he writes, it was on the motion, he's talking about the House of Burgesses in 1765, for establishing of an office for lending money and mortgages of real property. I could never forget a particular exclamation of his in the debate in which he electrified his hearers 
It had been urged that from certain unhappy circumstances of the colony, men of substantial property had contracted debts, which if exacted suddenly must ruin them and their families, but with a little indulgence of time might be paid. So in other words, people owe money, give them some time to pay it. Don't expect, don't demand the money right away and ruin the people. And then Henry writes, according to Jefferson, what, sir, exclaimed Mr. Henry, in animadverting on this, is it proposed them to reclaim the spendthrift from his dissipation and extravagance by filling his pockets with money? You know, so Henry is basically saying, no, don't give them any time. This person, they were irresponsible in spending the money. They should pay it up, you know, Scrooge, pay it up immediately. Jefferson writes, these expressions are indelibly impressed on my memory. He laid open with so much energy the spirit of favoritism on which the proposition was founded and the abuse to, to which it would lead, that it was crushed in its birth. So Henry comes in and another declamation, a famous declamation, you know, is basically saying, look, if people are, are given money, if they can't pay it back on time, if we give them, you know, some leeway, we're setting a dangerous precedent. Right. And Henry won the day. Um Here's one more, a I'll, I'll, couple more I'll read. He's talking about uh, his first acquaintance with Henry in 1759. Jefferson is 43, so he's 16. We met at Nathaniel Dandridge's in Hanover about the Christmas of that winter and passed perhaps a fortnight together at the reveries of the neighborhood in season. His manners had something of the coarseness of the society he had frequented, his passion was fiddling, dancing, and pleasantry. He excelled in the last, and it attached everyone to him. The occasion, perhaps, as much as the idle disposition, prevented his engaging in any conversation which might give him the measure either of his mind or information. Opportunity was not wanting because Mr. John Campbell was there, who had married Mrs. Spotswood, the sister of Colonel Dandridge. He was a man of science and often introduced conversations on scientific subjects Mr. Henry had a little before broke up the store, or rather it had broken him up. And then three months after he came to Williamsburg for his license and told me, I think he had read law not more than six weeks. So there we have a couple of things. Henry gets his license to practice law after studying for law for six weeks when Jefferson's cramming 14 hours a day for years. Uh, whenever he's in social settings, Jefferson said, he would play the fiddle and stay away from conversations that might get deep where he can expose, where there was a chance of him being exposed as a fraud, as someone who didn't know much. So he had the, Jefferson is suggesting or saying, he had the appearance of someone who's very per persuasive, powerful, great oratorical skills, but you got to know him, he didn't know much. So he, he knew that and he stayed away from opportunities where someone could prove him to be a fraud. Right. A um, couple more. He said the study and learning ascribed to him, he tells Wirt, in this passage would be inconsistent with the excellent and just picture given of his indolence, his laziness through the rest of the work. So he's objecting to William Wirt's description of this, him being a very studious and learned, learned person. A first reading of a book he could accomplish sometimes and on some subjects, but never a second. He knew well the geography of his own country, again, here's a concession, but certainly never made any other study. So as to our ancient charters, he had probably read those of Stith's history, but no man ever more undervalued chartered titles than himself. All right, and he talks about Henry in conversation. He never in conversation or debate mentioned a hero, a worthy or in fact agreement, a Greek or Roman history, but so vaguely and loosely as to leave the room to back out if he found he had blundered. Um, and then, you know, so he's very critical. And then he talks about Patrick Henry's intentions. He goes, here's a guy, okay, who speaks without knowing in, in great measure what he's saying. But Jefferson makes this concession. He says he drew all natural rights from a pure source, not his intellect, the feelings of his own breast from his moral sense. Now, I'll end with that. That's a very powerful sentence. Basically what he's saying, Jefferson says the same about blacks. The blacks are the moral equals of all people. He's saying for whatever defects Henry had, he was a good man. 
He couldn't speak. He wasn't logical. He wasn't highly intelligent. Uh, he couldn't speak logically, but he could speak persuasively. But he had good intentions. He was a lover of liberty, lover of the American cause. He says the feelings of his own breast, Jefferson is saying, were spot on. To me, that's a massive concession. You can't say that he hated Henry. He respected highly Henry. He found Henry puzzling because he wasn't a very intelligent person, but yet he could was a very persuasive person. Right. A little bit of jealousy without question, but he also concedes he had a good heart. And I think he would say were he alive today that there would not have been a revolution without Patrick Henry. What do you think about that? So, that's why I had this. I think about it. <laughs> I don't know how you did that, but you know, um, react I have... at the bottom of the screen. React. So that that makes me happy. Yeah, oh, okay. but um, yeah, and I'm going to do this because we're getting close to the end. I, I found I figured I'll do that to let you know we need to wind it down because we're. Well, I don't have anything else to say anyway. I'm just. I time. think this was you know pretty. It's a, it's a very aha moment for me because I realized yeah. Jefferson really was a stoic. And I'm u I use that approach whenever Jefferson talks about anybody and it works. Right. He's highly critical, but he also gives them their due. Right. And and, um, and he's honest. He's not trying to sugarcoat anything. He's not That's right. minimizing anything. He's he's we get a clear view of what I, I think his is probably the more accurate view because he's so honest and 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 you know I think along with um, maybe the stoic types they may not be so concerned with the social uh, graces. Uh, well, watch what you, you know, he just said. Are you telling me that Jefferson would not do well with the DEI at at uh, academic institutions? You think they would uh, throw him out after about an hour of, of teaching or speaking? <laughs> Probably. He's insensitive. He's honest. Well, no, I, yeah, and I don't think he's doing it to be cruel. He's just wired that no. way. I mean, just like we have people that, that he's. Well, see, the, the one thing I'll say about Stoic philosophy, Stoics were absolutely intent that virtue was just a matter for the Stoics of speaking truthfully. Right. To sugarcoat something was morally wrong for them because right. you have a misperception of the situation. Right. If someone's a a speaker who speaks without knowledge but is persuasive, you need to say that. You can't say, oh, he's highly intelligent when he's not. Right. That's morally wrong for the Stoics, morally wrong for Aristotle, morally wrong, I would say, for Plato as well. And Jefferson respected that, the truthfulness. So I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. And that's, that's something I we all, I don't know, it's something I work on constantly <laughs> because sometimes I have a, a, I can be very abrupt and just say what I see without thinking of how to soften it or make it, you um, can hurt people's feelings today. Easier, easier on You're the all ears. very sensitive. Well, I don't yeah, see, I, by the way, I don't see your pronouns up under your name. Oh, I'm it. <laughs> You're an it. Yeah, yeah. I, that's the easiest thing to do. Just pick every single pronoun. You answer to all of them. Yeah. All of the above. Well, you know, the one positive, see, I always try to find the positive in everything. And the one pro positive thing now is that my children know what a pronoun is. Because if if all of this hadn't happened over the past few years, they would not know what a pronoun is. There you go. There's so we're there. learning language arts and grammar. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I mean, I guess we're done, huh? I don't have anything for next week. Wow. We're going to do one work, five questions. We'll figure out what to do. Wow, we finished before we got well, You're this playing thing. around with all these new gadgets you got there. Look at the heart react at the bottom. You just press that. Yeah, and, I know. I just you I, have, I don't want yeah. to take away your play toys and make them my play toys here. Right. All right. We'll do this again next week. Ta ta. Yeah, this is great.